Did Vegan Cheetah pull the race card? This is a world, this is a world premiere. This is a world. Hey y'all, welcome back for some more food for thought. So I got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Actually, not really that much. I'm gonna kind of try to keep it limited to a few key topics, but they are gonna be some topics that are gonna take us like all over the place. And we're gonna go going, we're gonna be going into history. So for those of you who like hate it when I get stuck in the past, you might wanna, you know, shut this video off and head for the hills, whatever that means. I mentioned yesterday that Vegan Revolution suggested that maybe Margaret of Mod Vegan was harboring some suppressed racism because of some comments that she made. There are some folks who are kind of like all over Margaret right now because of a video that she made last week just talking about folks being on the right side of history. And recently I made a comment on Vegan Cheetah's channel mostly talking about this idea of free speech and the idea that maybe Charles isn't really quite grasping what free speech is all about, at least in the United States, as it is framed in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of tolerance, which is something that I've been teasing that I'd get more into. The first definition that popped up was the capacity to endure pain. And I don't know that that's what people have in mind when they talk about tolerance, but it's important that that root of meaning is clear. I think the more familiar is this idea of the ability or willingness to tolerate something, in particular the existence of opinions uh, or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. I think when most of us talk about tolerance, that's what's in mind. Please let me know in the comments section if you disagree with that idea. But one of the reasons is I wanted to kind of give some emphasis to this original and root meaning of the word tolerance is that there is something of martyrdom folded up in this idea, right? To be tolerant is to bear the weight of something that is not your own for the sake of virtue, right? It's virtuous to be tolerant of others. And that is whether you are being tolerant of someone because of the color of their skin or you're being tolerant uh, of someone because they have bad habits, right? Uh, it really calls on one to rise above their, you know, more kind of petty feelings of, you know, annoyance or whatever that is and be a better person, be the bigger person. So um, another thing that is uh, interesting about that is it has often been used as ways to control oppressed groups by, you know, preaching to them this virtue of tolerance and that in the afterlife, you're going to get some reward for it, right? You're going to go to heaven and you're going to, you know, sit behind, beside God's throne, right? Because you've been tolerant of the, you know, suffering in, in the life that you've tolerated suffering in your, in, on, in your, you know, on earth. But, um, you know, it's it's also a way to you know stop people from re rebelling, right? It's uh, from and, and it's been effective, but it's also you know backfired at certain points in history. My experience of of you know the conversation around tolerance has often been well historically, uh, as in my experience, as I said, has historically been about uh, dominant groups being asked to be tolerant of. Um, oppressed groups or minority groups. So we're asked to be, you know, we should be more tolerant of race. We should be more tolerant of people from different, different ethnicities. We should be tolerant of, you know, gays and lesbians and people from the LGBTQIA uh, plus community. So we should be, we should be tolerant of these things, right? Um, that was what was being asked historically, historically, although the concept of LGBTQIA plus was not, um, was not around when I was having these conversations as a kid, right? But um, so now it seems that we're seeing a shift. And now again, as I said before, now it seems to be traditionally dominant groups who are demanding tolerance from people who have been the suppressed groups. So now we're being asked to tolerate you know, Nazis and Klan members and, and you know, racist and white supremacist, right? So I think that that is super interesting that that 
shift is happening and not surprising that we're seeing that shift as there is greater and greater political unrest. So yeah, yeah. Um, so that's fine, that's fine. Um, you know, this idea that, you know, it takes time for change to occur and we're being asked to be tolerant, that's one thing. But to be tolerant, you know, of something simply saying, you know, you have to deal, you know, swallow it, deal with it, is, is another thing. Now, I want to talk about my own tolerance because that's very different than this sort of like larger political idea of what it means to be tolerant. Um, or societal idea of what it means to be tolerant. And so in terms of my own t um, tolerance, I'm certainly su suspicious when I am asked asked by others to be tolerant uh, in the face of something that I perceive as an injustice. Um, now, it's one thing for someone to point out to me that there may not be an injustice here. And so they're asking me to be you know, patient, right? Like, hold on a second, let's look at this idea. But if we all understand that what's happening is you know, wrong, and by we all understand, I mean like, on a you know real real tip level, it's just we know it's just wrong. We wouldn't want it to happen to us, but we're you know ask we're either being tolerant of it happening to others, or you know the person who it's targeted that you know bad behavior is targeted towards is being asked to be tolerant of it. I think that that's absolutely ridiculous, and and um, in some ways it sounds like a little bit more like laziness than anything else. I think that tolerance in general should be reserved for situations where there's nobody who can be faulted, right? So you know we can be you know tolerant, we can tolerate the weather, or we can be even tolerant of ignorance, right? Especially if we understand that the ignorance is not the fault of the person, but they just have not been in circumstances where they would have learned better. Tolerating bad behavior that's done with the intention of causing harm is, you know, absolutely rid ridiculous. It's unacceptable. Um, when it comes to tolerating, you know, people's vices, that's for me, a really tricky area, um, and it's and by vices I mean like smoking, right? Or or someone who you know just just vices in general. Somebody who spends too much money, things like that. Being tolerant of those things, which is something else that I think that we're often asked to be tolerant of. Um, you know, because everybody's on their journey, we're asked to be, you know, vegans are asked to be tolerant of people who, you know, consume animal products. When we're asked to be tolerant in, in, in these areas, when it comes to vices, I often feel for myself that it's a little bit like making room for one's own faults, right? So if I'm tolerant of someone else's vices, then I can go ahead and pull out whatever it is that I want to pull out. <laughs> um, and that could be bad because then we end up simply enabling each other bad behavior and possibly by you know addressing these vices not so much as you know you're a bad person but you know I noticed that this thing happens and I noticed that I have this thing can you you know let's let's support each other and like do, do you want to do better can we support each other in doing better I don't know if that would ever work I don't know if that would ever come off as anything but condescending or offensive or I don't know what but um, I certainly f feel that simply being tolerant of vices um, uh, can can cause can can one be enabling but it can also just create space for one to start to indulge their own vices in a way that's not healthy that doesn't help anyone so again i'm really grateful to nanya business for starting this conversation and thanks to everyone who's engaged in it um let's keep it going so getting back to vegan cheetah pulling the race card um before we even get into it this is not going to be like a call out section but i am going to talk about something that i see as a pattern not necessarily for vegan cheetah but it's something that was, you know, it was made blaringly obvious that this is something that's like really happening <laughs> in the world. Um, so Vegan Cheetah, um, you know, again, I said I, I've been engaged in a comment thread on Vegan Cheetah's channel, and he responded to me, you know, questioning his understanding of freedom of speech and really just questioning his understanding, not thinking that he's, you know, wrong about his opinion, but like just being clear that we're talking about the same thing. So his response was really out of the blue. He says, Reg, Flowers. So if you're a black and gay, you can say whatever you want, right? But if you're white and straight, this isn't about your freedom of speech. And he's and he's quoting that because that's what I what I said. It's that his complaint wasn't about freedom of speech. It was actually about terms of service, at least as far as having his account canceled at you now. He goes on to say, if you were silenced for being black and gay, I think you'd be outraged. 
oh, but I'm white, so I shouldn't be upset with anything because I don't experience systematic oppression. How long do you think before middle America is going to resist that? How long, Reg? A year, maybe two. Remember, Trump won, the people have spoken. So first of all, you know, again, bringing up race in this conversation, it, if anything, it's more helpful to me, right? Because I can say, uh, no, I don't have any special rights because I'm black or gay. Um, I have to watch what I say when I, when I, you know, make a video that has the word racist in the title, that video gets flagged, you know, just like anyone else. So, um, so it's not really just a question of, this is not a question of me feeling like, um, vegan cheetah shouldn't have rights. But again, um, cheetah, the conversation isn't about whether or not you as a white person, you as a, you know, man should have the right to speak uh, or not have the right to speak. It's a question of what happened with you and you now. You now has canceled your, uh, you know, banned you or whatever it is. And I just want to make clear that it's not in that case. It is not a matter of free speech. Free speech in the Constitution protects us from the state. The state can't take punitive action against a citizen for speech. In some cases, speech that is directed from one individual to another can have impl implications, right? And so the state may be inclined to get involved. What's strange to me is that we see, you know, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, standing up and taking the position of a victim. And we see it, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos, the alt-right. We see this kind of army of uh, people who would traditionally be considered, you know, the privileged, the dominant class, white men now saying, you know, my freedom of speech is under attack. What is so ironic to me is that this idea of rights that have been conferred on us by the state, although they are considered to be inalienable rights, um, uh, have very often historically been denied to other groups, right? Uh, these rights, when we, you know, even people from the alt-right will come out and tell you that, you know, the America was made for white, for white people, right? They understand, they understand on some level that these rights were never intended for people who were non-white, right? And at the same time, they were denied to even white women, right? Um, and certain white people without land, right? So uh, this idea of these rights have always been in jeopardy and in fact flat out denied, right? Black people couldn't carry arms, right? And these um, these um, denials of rights were institutional, right? They were they were um, in, written into codes and then laws, um, you know, codes when we were a colony, but they were, you know, codes that had, you know, legal, they were legally binding. Um, you know, a black person could be, you know, you know, a black person could be, you know, put killed for lifting their hand to a, a, a white person. A black person certainly could not carry a gun, but yet, you know, we have this whole thing about the, the right to bear arms, right? And in terms of freedom of speech and assembly, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, all of these things were, were always limited. I mean, up into the mid 20th century, these things were limited to people who were non-white. So it's very ironic uh, to me now to hear the group who really was the only group that was ever made this promise, you know, really um, uh, kind of getting out of arms, getting, you know, getting up in arms because these, these rights are being challenged. Uh, we have to understand that the codes that were created in the late 17th century you know, that became slave codes that, you know, denied rights to Native Americans. They denied rights to uh, African slaves, you know, even freedom, right? <laughs> even freedom, right? These things were, you know, also part of a strategy to control poor whites as well, or people who could have been identified as whites, but they were Europeans, right? We're talking about Irish. We were talking about, um, we're talking about, um, at the time we're talking about Irish. We're talking about, um, some Dutch, we're talking about uh, primarily English. 
Englishmen. But these are Engl these are Englishmen who came to this country. They were poor. Often they were um, sent here, um, you know, as punishment for crimes. So you know, we're not talking about folks who came to the United States who were on equal class footing with the ruling class, right? These were people who were the lower class and they had been cooperating with Africans. <laughs> but um, to put a stop to that, these, you know, this idea of white supremacy was created with the express purpose of dividing um, poor and working class people. So I think it's really important for the descendants of those settlers and even you know people who can be identified as white in the United States today to keep in mind that whiteness was done as much to those early Europeans in the colonies as it was done to Africans right that whiteness was you know thrust on them there wasn't really a choice right <laughs> it wasn't like you could say well no I don't want to be white I want to right what was what was what were your what were your options at that time and so um, the sad part is that that whiteness, although it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just like kind of like a badge of honor, right? It's like a medal. You can show people the medal and you can say, look, I'm this great thing, but you know, that, that medal isn't that medal and a, you know, and a, and $4 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Right. So just keeping in mind that, um, it is possible that this, um, you know, violent desire to hold on to these institutions that obtain, that maintain white supremacy. These are things that were packaged together specifically to silence, to control, to have alliance between the ruling class and poor and working class rights. So once those are dissolved, then there's no more you know that's what you know that's the that's the that's the alliance right that's the treaty between poor whites and the ruling class is that they get to maintain this thing called white supremacy and it may at some time have been you know even resisted or people might have been scratching their heads wondering what the hell that is but now it is firmly firmly rooted in uh, American culture. And so to ask people to give up white supremacy is in many ways a betrayal, it would be a betrayal of the ruling class, even if, you know, these folks don't even necessarily want it, right? It's like being told you have to give up your religious faith, even if you're not somebody who's practicing, how might one react to someone telling them that you can't be Catholic or you can't be a uh, Baptist or you can't be Lutheran, right? What does that, what would that mean to people? Um, and, you know, that plays out in the fact that, you know, we have 18 million poor whites in this country. That's 18 million white people living below the poverty, poverty line for whom there is not much hope of ever treat, achieving the American dream. So really all that group is holding on to, if anything, is the notion of their white supremacy. And so I think it becomes very dangerous when we have a conversation about stripping people of the one thing that they have been able to hold on to even though the thing that they have been asked to hold on to itself becomes a deadly force in the United States, which is why I believe the conversation about race in the United States is one that has to be handled so delicately, right? This was something that was instituted not simply in people making a claim, but you had the scientific community, you had the church, you had philosophers, you had politicians, you had Thomas Jefferson when he was running for office, right? Um, we're talking, you know, uh, Donald Trump loves to talk about Thomas Jefferson and saying, you know, is Thomas Jefferson's statue gonna be taken off? Well, Thomas Jefferson, when he was running for president, did the same thing that Trump did. He used race as a way to, um, to uh, gather support amongst poor whites who were afraid of, you know, what might that, you know, blacks might be elevated somehow, right? And we'd look at Thomas Jefferson as a decent person, but he's, you know, he stood in front of crowds of people and said that, you know, black people are inferior. Black people have, uh, they suffer, they have no, they, they have suffering well enough, but they have no poetry, right? He says. So um, just keeping in mind the role that white supremacy has played, as much as we dislike white supremacy, it is the tool that has kept a certain portion of the population under control. 
<laughs> under control. And so it makes as much sense for, you know, people who identify as white to be up in arms uh, at the threat of the removal or the extraction um, of, the, uh, of white supremacy. So that's, <laughs> that's where I'm coming with that. Um, uh, like I said, just a couple of things, but I think some ideas that are big enough that uh, I probably don't want to overload you. I still want to have a conversation about Steve Bannon. I don't know if that's going to happen this week or not. And there are now, a, I've, I've actually watched some more films, so there's some more film reviews coming your way. Um, and also let me know in the comments section if there's anything that you are interested in me talking about. And again, thanks to Nan Yabidness for uh, your question about tolerance and leading to some of this conversation that we're having today at least. That's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself. The world is a ghetto,